Blog Talk Radio. Welcome to Solutions with Courtney Anderson. I am your proud and happy host, Courtney Anderson. Today's topic is something that I find pretty intriguing. Our topic is health situation. I have 70,000 thoughts per day? Really? Wow. The wow is extra. This is a, a help situation show topic, and of course, when we have a help situation, we're, we're going to deal with a variety of different types of, you know, I don't want to call them problems. We're going to call them opportunities, right? We're all a work in progress, but we need help. We're not just sort of being a little bit more um, broad and abstract. We have a, a specific thing we're trying to address. And the the concept behind this this topic was I'm I'm constantly uh, curious. <laughs> um, and on the positive side, there's a lot of attributes and a lot of advantages to being a curious person. Uh, you get to pick up lots of trivia. I usually am pretty good at, at trivial pursuit or things about knowing at least cursory um, information about different things in the world because I'm curious. And the the challenge with being uh, curious is that with the technology that we have available now, a curious person, it's, it's being at a buffet that is unlimited in duration. There's unlimited servings, and you'll never be able to, to, to satiate. You know, to quell, to put down, to tame, you know, that, that tiger that's yearning and burning. I'm curious. I'm curious. And and the challenge, of course, is when we're just naturally curious, It's we're not just curious about our work. We're not just curious about things that are um, related to something that's happening, you know, directly in our lives. We're curious about lots of things. That means that sometimes I can find myself having spent, who knows how long, you know, reading about something that I never even thought of before because I sort of one thought leads to another thought leads to another thought. And before I know it, I'm like, wow. And then I wonder, you know, why am I, why am I behind on my laundry? Well, because you, you're, you're always so curious and, and so much information is out there, right? It's just like I said, for, for that person who's the information addict, it's, 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 it's exciting. It's awesome. It's great. It's wonderful. I mean, I'm, I'm, you know, so appreciative to be alive and experience this, but it also means that that it that we have to, at some point, uh, try to temper these drives. And so my curiosity led me, as it does, and I'm reading and I'm thinking and uh, what's going on, and I find uh, this um, this source um, from the University of California, Los Angeles, UCLA, and it's from their Laboratory of Neuroimaging. That, that's certainly um, sounds really impressive, and, and I'm sure it actually is. And the the question I was wondering, the thing that brought me to this to this source was I actually was curious, how many thoughts do we think a day? Because so much of uh the programs that I that I work on, uh so much of the things I do professionally are about trying to first I, I was gonna first, first say first understand behavior and then try to change it, but that's actually backwards. The reality of what I do, actually, is to try to change the behavior first. Uh, I don't put the investigation into why the behavior is what it was um, at the forefront, because that's not my goal. You know, my goal is not is not the diagnosis so much. My goal is the treatment. And I even have taught uh, my corporate and organizational training for years. Uh, I have a... a, a the, you know, the, I'll go to an organization and people ask me all these questions, right? Some, they're all variations on, you know, why does such so-and-so, right? Why does Amy, why does John, why does Jose, why does Amir, why do they do this thing, right? Why are they late to work? Why are they rude to me? Why don't they invite me to lunch? Um, why do they, uh, um, you know, kiss up to the boss? Why don't they bathe? You know, it's just all these questions. Why, 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 right? And so they're all basically the same question. Why does a person behave the way they do? That's the basic question, right? And so the the response that I've been giving for for a long time is, why do they do it? Here's the answer. The answer is they want to 
and they are allowed to. Because they want to, I'm repeating this, and because they are allowed to. Done. End of story. That's it. And, you know, one of the things certainly is that in the interest of just the limited amount of time that we have on the planet, certainly that I have, I do strive to come up with sort of clear um, processes and, and frameworks for for information because if we get lost in all the details, then sometimes it's just impossible to get anything done, right? So obviously there's more to why someone wants to do something, right? Like why do they want to be late? Why do they want to be rude to a customer? Why do they want to be rude to their uh, people that they supervise? Why do they not bathe? Oh, you know, all these things. I mean, there's a, there's, we could spend a lifetime, right, on just one person, on just one issue, right? So I understand that there's more depth and nuance to all of that, and there are so many fantastic areas of expertise that answer these questions in depth, um, which, in fact, is one of the ways I found the Laboratory of Neuroimaging at UCLA, right? Um, you know, there are people who are out in the world. This is the beauty of, of diversity, there's there's somebody somewhere else probably working on that issue. And if there isn't, then you should probably go ahead and start working on it. If it, if it comes to you and you, you can't find any research, that that's a perfect thing then for you to go and, and conduct the research, whether it's formally as part of a you know an academic program um, or professional program or just on your own, right? There's nothing stopping you from trying to figure that out. Um, so I simplify things because my job is to go fix things. Solutions. All about solutions, right? So somebody hires me as a lawyer. Um, the goal is they want to get divorced. So the outcome is they need to have somebody where at the end of this process, they have a piece of paper that says they're divorced, they're no longer married. That's the goal. That's the solution they want. Now, they, for me to sit there and spend, you know, 30 years trying to figure out why did their soon-to-be ex-spouse do these things, right? Why did they lie? Why did she cheat on me? You know, why did they um, refuse to help me with the laundry? Why was their mother so nice? Why was their cousin so Weird. I mean, I don't know, and we could figure that out, but that would be a lifetime, and the, and, the, and I would be, you know, fired and disbarred, and you know, because the goal was for me to get the paper that says you're not married. That's the goal. So I'm always focused on outcomes because that's what my my business and my perspective is in life, right? That's why I'm hired. The outcome. I I do process stuff, um, but that's not usually the the. The, the primary purpose that I'm engaged professionally, right? So as a lawyer, there's an outcome. As a professor, there's an outcome, right? The class needs to be taught. It has certain, you know, requirements. There are uh, skills or competencies that have to be uh, conveyed. There needs to be an assessment of those. There needs to be a continual dialogue with the students to help them understand what needs to be done to either improve uh, their work or expand their knowledge base. Um, and there's time constraints you know, for, for the process you know, the, the, the grades, and um, it's the outcome. I just can't sit there and and spend all my time sort of pondering the nature of ethics. Uh, that's part of what we do, but I can't just only do that because we've got, we've got to move a calendar and we've got, you know, outcomes and tasks and people need to get their credits completed so they can move toward graduation. I mean, there's, there's a process. Um, and certainly as a, as a corporate trainer, as a, as a speaker, I'm, I'm there at an organization um, to either solve a problem or to create uh, some sort of change in context. So motivation, increased engagement. So it's all about outcomes. So that's why I focus so much on it. So, yeah, so when I give my advice and I go and I say to somebody, you know, why did they do that? Because they wanted to and because they were allowed to. Yes, it's oversimplified, but it has to be in the interest of time. Um, can that be improved? Of course. I'm a work in progress. I'm just using this as a baseline for inter introducing how this idea came up for the show and then also kind of where the outcome is that I'm looking for. So uh, why do people do things? Because they want to and they're allowed to. I would then further explain, especially as a, when I'm working with an organization, um, you can't control the wanting part. Now, that's a whole area of, of, you know, study, right? If we could get to the point where we can control what people want, well, that would change everything. It would change marketing incredibly, right? Like, you don't even need ads. You know, once you get to a point where you can literally manipulate where people only want your product or service, then boom, you're set, right? Um, it's the controlling the wanting. And we also know in our personal lives, we, it's difficult. Even with someone that you might be a family member or someone that you care about deeply, um, if they want, 
self-destructive choices, right? Maybe they abuse drugs or alcohol or food or, or anything. You know, you can't stop them from wanting it. And we all know how, how difficult and challenging it can be. So the wanting is the first part, and that's the part that I usually just table because I don't have any ability in the in the professional settings I'm engaged in to, to address that. I mean, it's beyond my control, and I don't have the time or the resources or the staff or the tools. And I'm fascinated by it. I really am. I just that, but I can't fix that part right now. What I do is say to people, why do they do something? Because they want to and they're allowed to. Okay, great. You can't, con- for the sake of argument, we'll table the, the why they want to part, right? But you can control that they're allowed to, right? So why does why is somebody late to work? I don't know. I don't know. Maybe they stay up late. Maybe they get up on time, but then they, you know, spend too long in the shower, you know, or maybe they're um, having issues, you know, with their getting their uh, schedule with their household and getting their, you know, kids organized and or their dogs or whatever. I mean, I don't, I don't know. Maybe they they live too far away. Maybe you know, who knows? But I do know this. I can't tell you, like, you know, without knowing all the details, why they want it. But I can tell you that you can stop allowing it, right? So if they come to work late, okay, you give a consequence. And at some point, sooner rather than later, you give a consequence that if they're going to be late, they're not going to work here. So you fixed it. Now, you didn't necessarily make the person um, change their behavior so that they're on time. But you certainly changed their behavior so they're not late where you were. And that's what we focus on. So in trying to go um, – and a little bit more, you know, nuance in in this because this is what I've been doing all these years, and um, I guess I'm going in. I think I, I'm pretty. I think I'm going into my 15th year uh, of doing this sort of consulting, corporate training, uh, keynote speaking, where I'm dealing with organizational behavior change and I'm applying it literally, you know, at an organization or at a, a conference or an event. Um, and so I was wondering, all right, well. You can you can you can you can fix the the context, right? I'm not going to allow you to be late. I'm not going to allow you to be drunk at work. I'm not going to allow you to yell at a at a team member. I'm not going to allow you to steal. Um, and you can do it in society, right? That's that's what so much of, of what the legal system deals with, right? Um, I can't stop you from wanting, you know, to beat up your your spouse, but I can stop allowing you to beat me up, right? I'm going to call the police. I'm going to testify against you. You'll go to jail. I'm going to get a restraining order. And for real, I'm going to enforce it, meaning like it's that not, I'm not going to get a restraining order and then call you 10 minutes later and beg you to come over and say I miss you. But I mean, seriously, like I can't stop you from wanting to, to abuse somebody, but I can stop you from being allowed to abuse me. And that's what I spend so much time on. So in this quest, I'm wondering, all right, what's the deal with this? Why, why is it so difficult for people to change? You know, why is it so difficult for somebody to think, all right, I like my family. I don't want them to leave me just because maybe maybe I don't maybe I don't do anything physically bad to people. Maybe I just nag all the time and yell at people. And there are people who who divorce someone for that because it's it's just it's it it wears on them and they don't and they're not happy and they don't want to live like that. Um, and and there are people who might think, well, why would you lose a a good family just because you you can't stop nagging and, and being mean? Well, the truth is, it, it it it's harder than it seems because so many things in society would be different, right? Like you would think it's you know it's it's pretty evident, right? Okay, get up earlier, then you'll be on time. Um, stop having words come out of your mouth that are cruel to people you claim you care about, and that won't drive them away. Um, these things aren't magic. So, quest looking, trying to have that that curiosity of, um, at least <laughs> fueled. A little bit. I, I went out and, and found this data, and I hope it's accurate. For the sake of argument, we're going to stick with it's accurate. So the question is, okay, so you need somebody to think about the the things they're doing in life, but how much are they actually thinking? And this idea that we're that the data uh, puts forth that we're that we're thinking seventy thousand things a day, seventy thousand. Not 10,000, not 20,000, not 30,000, 70,000 a day? Really? I mean, I, I mean, I, I know I, I think a lot because I have sort of these ongoing, um, you know, thoughts and ideas and I'm constantly interested in, in different things. But even to me, that seemed incredibly high. 70,000? But I guess so. It's possible. I mean, I, 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 you know, you think a lot, right? Like, I need to go to the bathroom. I got to put my shoes on. Where are my car keys? 
my stomach hurts, I'm hungry. I mean, there's a lot going on, right? And then on top of that, all this other stuff. Um, you know, you know, what does it mean that I'm here? I wonder what my what my dream career is. Why doesn't the person that I want to date me like me? I mean, there's so much, you know, to think about. Um, so I let's just to say it's it's accurate. If it's accurate that it's somewhere around seventy thousand on average per day per person, now it 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 becomes. I think, for me at least, incredibly clear why it's so difficult to change. Okay, so let's say that, that, that we're thinking our 70,000 thoughts. Now, most of these, we're not, it's not some elaborate plan, right? Because if you had to sit and put work into creating each of the 70,000 thoughts that you were aware of, like a conscious effort, like trying to solve some elaborate, you know, um, math problem. If you had to do that, if you had to solve, you know, some elaborate math problem 70,000 times a day, um, even if you love math, that's a lot of w mental work, right? So these other thoughts, the ones like, oh, I have to go to the bathroom, my stomach hurts, or it's hot, or, you know, that person's getting on my nerves, or, gosh, people can't drive. What? I mean, all that stuff, where's that coming from? A lot of those, obviously, are repetitive, right? Some of them are, are driven by um, biological functions or chemical functions in our body, right? My stomach hurts, I have to go to the bathroom. <laughs> um, and... A lot of them have these sort of historical um, framework that they're that they're adhering to. In the show notes, I gave an example. Okay, so I go and I, you know, you ask me a question about your company or your business or whatever your goals. I'm going to tell you the same thing, basically. You know, what do you want is the first thing I'm always going to ask. Because if you can't articulate what you want, then you really don't. Then there's no hope. Because until you can figure that out, then nobody else can can help you. Like I don't know. And so one of the things that people do is they'll say something like, oh, I really want to get a promotion or make more money. Okay, that's easy. That sounds reasonable, right? And that's tangible. But then they get in this process where they literally tell themselves thoughts that prevent the outcome that they claim they want, right? So you say you want to be successful at work and, you know, thus if you're more successful, then you'll, you know, you'll potentially get a, a, a pay increase or, or benefit increase and then you'll, you know, be more um Please, because you'll have more opportunities, because you'll have more resources, right? So, I gave this example in the show notes. Uh, somebody's uh, getting ready, you know, for, for work, and, and they start thinking to themselves, and they think, oh, gosh, I am, I'm such a loser. Oh, I'm such a loser. No one would ever listen to my ideas at work, because, because they suck. All right. If you tell yourself in your thoughts that you're a loser and that no one will listen to you and that your ideas are not good, then, okay, probably you believe that, right? You know, if you tell yourself you have to go to the bathroom and you legitimately do have to go to the bathroom, then you probably believe I have to go to the bathroom. If you tell yourself that you're a loser and no one listens to you and your ideas aren't any good, then, okay, then that's then fine. Perception's reality, right? This is your own perception of yourself. And of of how you think other people perceive you. So if you think that and you tell yourself that in your head and then you go to work and then sure enough, now it's your time, you know, in a meeting to say something, yeah, I don't think you're going to give some kind of stellar, you know, um, persuasive presentation because already in your head you're like, I'm a loser and no one listens to me. And you see this manifested, right? You go somewhere and you'll see somebody – um, and they actually do have probably pretty decent ideas or maybe even great ideas. You know, we don't know. But they don't speak up. Or when they do speak, they do all this either literally with their volume and their and their projection of their voice. They're just like, well, I don't know. I'm not – I don't know. I mean, I, I've been thinking something, but, you know, I, I don't know what the group will think. You know, they make themselves so quiet and they're so – they're, they're, they're literally vocally showing you behaviorally, I'm not worth it. Don't listen to me, right? I'm quiet. You can't hear me. There's no passion or energy behind what I'm saying. Um, and then they often use a whole bunch of qualifying phrases. So I've seen this. I wish I had a, a penny for every time I've seen this as a, as a business uh, solution provider. So you're, you're, you're there and somebody's talking and they'll say something like this. Even if they speak up, right? So you can hear them. Like this is not the thing where they turn their volume so low and they're just literally trying to hide with their voice. But someone will say something like in a meeting, um, 
hey guys, yeah, uh, I have an idea. It's it's probably not you know that much, and I'll, you know I, it's just something I haven't even thought through it. I mean, you know, honestly, it's you know it's just kind of a, a, like a rough draft. Um, but I, I'm just gonna throw it out there anyway. Okay. When somebody starts to use all those qualifiers, right? It's not thought through. It's a rough draft. It's probably you know um, not ready. Well, then why? Are, if you're telling me all this, then what what, do you, what on earth do you think my the reception is gonna be? You know, it's like going to a restaurant, right? And um, you, it's a restaurant you've never been to, and so it looks, you know, pretty awesome. And you sit down, and and you, you know, you're waiting, and then here comes the person that works there to take your order. And then, you know, you ask them because you've never been there. You'd say, you know, what do you recommend? And then they say, and this, this is while you're sitting at the restaurant, right? Like literally right now, ready to buy something to eat. <laughs> and they say something like, Yeah, um, I don't know. You know, some of the food, it's just, you know, I don't think it's really, you know, the best. I mean, it's kind of like maybe a rough draft of, like, like what a good dish would be. Okay. Now, you rarely hear that in real life because, of course, people will be immediately fired, um, or they should be. And I say that as someone who myself has been fired as a, a weight person, okay? So that's not me, you know, from some high horse. Um, but if you're telling somebody who's trying to buy your, your food, if they're telling your customer that, you know, oh, it's probably not that good or I'm not really sure, Really? And it's the same thing. You're selling yourself and your ideas all the time. You're doing it at work, literally, right? Like for time or money or if it's volunteer work for, for outcome. And you're doing it even in your personal life. You're trying to convince other people, invest in me. Invest in me as a friend. Invest in me as a, as a, as a spouse. Invest in me as, as someone that you can trust. Like, but if you're telling other people, Right? Like they're right there, ready to order. They're ready to order a new business idea. They're ready to order somebody to be their new friend. They're ready to order, you know, someone to, to be in a relationship with. And you're st- and before you, you can even get to what you're selling, what you have to offer, you start telling them, Oh, it's not any good. Well, hey, well if you if you are, you know, you are you, you know, let's like working at the restaurant and tell me that it's not probably good. You know, right? You work here. I've never been here. And you're putting yourself out to the world. So if you're the chef of yourself and you say it's not good. My ideas are, are are aren't good. Then then okay. Then if you can't, don't believe it's good, then I know it's not good, right? Okay. People do this all the time. It's so self destructive. And I think part of the thing that intrigues me and kind of is exciting about this idea of trying to quantify how many ideas you have is is to acknowledge how hard it is. It's not like, you you know, sometimes I, I I think people get frustrated with me and they'll say, yeah, well, you know, you talk, like you say these things like it's easy. Like it's easy to, you know, to give somebody consequences for, you know, being drunk at work. Or it's easy to give somebody consequences uh, in a family for, you know, being abusive. And I'm not saying it's easy. What I'm saying is that if you don't change the consequence, then you're not going to be able to change any of the of the outcome because it's it's very difficult. Remember, people do things because they want to and they're allowed to. They have to make their own decisions about what they want to. And that's why I said you can't do it because the person has to do it. That's their own journey. That's what part of what this show is about, right, is that part. Why is it so hard for us to individually change? Well, if I'm having 70,000 thoughts already every day, just automatically kind of, um, and then I add new ideas, if I got to do something new, like drive to a new place or try a new activity or meet a new person, man, I'm already overloaded. And if I want to change a narrative, if I want to change some of these thoughts, it's not like I just tell myself some, you know, daily affirmation. Okay, so, you know, I wake up, the, the, the person who says to themselves, I'm a loser, no one listens to me, you know, but they wake up the next day and they say, okay, I'm going to change. And they say to themselves, all right, you know, I'm, I'm, as, I'm as valuable as everybody else in my office, and, and you know, I have the, the, the right and, and, and almost the obligation, you know, to speak up and, and share some of my ideas. All right, they tell themselves that, right? And there's all kind of books and resources and tools and techniques um, available, right? There's tons of this. This is, a whole, this is a global industry, you know, trying to help people. Like, you can do this. You can change your thoughts, right? And if, even if you do it and you start off the day or, you know, and, and you, you have your affirmation, you, you're doing your thing, you get to your work, and maybe at your work you have, you know, there's posters, motivational posters and stuff everywhere, right? You can do it. All right. You can dream it. You can achieve it, whatever. Um, and I'm not knocking that because I'm, you know, in that industry too at some level. But if you're, t- if you have said one or two good things, good meaning trying to change your outcome, right? Trying to give yourself the narrative to say, hey, I'm worth something. My ideas are worth something. But if you only give yourself a couple of ideas and then you have, you know, 55,000 other ideas in your head repeating daily, 
And a lot of them are going to be these sort of routine ideas. And if your routine idea and framework is, I'm a loser, my ideas aren't good. Even if you tell yourself with your affirmations and your posters and you're really working it, right, like you're trying really hard, there's going to be thousands and thousands of thoughts that are still going to be coming at you that are the same old narrative, that old idea, right? Your ideas aren't any good. But all this is, in, in my opinion, um, is sobering because, you know, it's, it's, it is daunting. It really is to begin to work through the amount of labor that has to be invested to try to change, to, to, to really try to change where you believe, not just sort of your parroting or regurgitating, um, you know, I can do it, I, I believe in me. But if you, you know, but if you really don't believe in you, then you, how much, you know, time and, and energy and labor is it going to take to, to really affect something where you've actually reprogrammed yourself? Um, and there's tons of work in this, right? And in, in the in the neurosciences and the linguistic field, and um, one thing that I certainly have found to be helpful for me personally is that it's just a, a, my own very simplified understanding of the idea of just going in your own head, meaning. You know, we have all these thoughts, right? And then most people also, in addition to their own 70,000 thoughts in their head, have so much on their plate externally. Um, you know, they've, they've got um, their work and they've got, you know, their family and they've got all these things. And so they have so little time because, you know, they've got to take care of a lot of other people. So they're not able to sort of luxuriate and, and, and work through the, the understanding, the, the severity and the, sort of the compound interest of, of, of narrative. You know, like I'm not good or my ideas aren't good or, you know, I'm I'm not able to do that. Um, and without making a decision that this is going to be a priority or the priority, um, I don't think it's possible for people to just sort of luck into some dramatic change. You know, you got your 70,000 thoughts going and if you don't have four minutes a day to, to be with your own self in your own head, you know, because it's just constantly, you know, people coming at you and you have all these other people to take care of and all these other needs, then how would you ever have the time to begin to start to, to, to deal with this? Um, I think meditation, which is one of the things I think to, is helpful. Um, there's a ton of, of um, research that, that's, that's available and a lot that's, that's proposed to look at sort of the consequences of the idea of just going in your own head. Now, meditation is um, simply the idea that you're – Listen to your thoughts. And it sounds weird because you, because you might think, well, yeah, we're always listening to our thoughts, right? 70,000 of them. But you're, really, but you're really not, though. Often you're just sort of moving, right? Like you're going, you're going, you're going. How many times do you sit in quiet and stillness and really just listen and try to get a handle on, you know, what's going on in there? Where is it coming from? What does it mean? How are you processing these things? It's harder than it sounds. Uh, but there is. You know, I think that's one thing I would certainly put forward as a suggestion. You know, it's not futile. You know, I, I, I look at the data and I and I get overwhelmed too and I think, Wow. But you know, look at humans, look at what we look at what we can do as people. I mean the technology, the 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 inventions, the art, the beauty in the world. Look at what we can do. So you know, I'm always gonna be uh an optimist. But I think that when we have data like this, it helps us begin to understand the severity of the situation. This is not a joke, and it's not easy. Investing in yourself is the hardest thing you'll ever do. Trying to wrangle your thoughts and ideas and, and take control of, of, your, of your mind is going to be the, the biggest challenge of any person's life. So I thank you so much for joining me. Please come to CourtneyAnderson.com. Uh, I encourage you to continue to get out there and be curious yourself, intellectually engaged in the world, and 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 learn and something new every day, even if it's something little, um, and be proud of yourself. Thank you so much for joining me.